one other quick thing before we get into God's Word. Uh, you might receive emails from the church on a weekly basis, uh, stuff that's going on, uh, and then there's also a note that goes out on Fridays from me to those that are on that list. Just talking about stuff that's going on at the church. If you are not getting those emails and you want them, uh, please fill out one of those Connect cards uh, and give it to someone here, to myself or someone on staff, and we'll get you on those lists. you got to know that we want to communicate with you, but you need to give us uh, your information so we can communicate to you. So uh, this past Friday, I sent out one of my, my Friday letter, uh, and it was talking about this next series that we are going into. And for several months, I've been praying about how to encourage us during this election season. Uh, Clearly, uh, we are living in tumultuous and anxious times, and perhaps you this morning are feeling anxious about what's going to happen. What what does this election season actually mean? What are the implications and ramifications? Uh, And so clearly there's also some very serious matters in this upcoming election. Uh, You may be aware of two in particular. Uh, We're voting on something related to abortion, Uh, in this election, and also on marriage. These are both constitutional things in the state of Colorado. Uh, If you are not informed of these things, you need to get informed of them, okay? Because these are important matters for us as followers of Jesus Christ to be engaged with and understand the issues that are at hand. So what I want to do is uh, just bring you into my thought process of what I've been thinking as I've been praying about how do I encourage us as a church family? What, What do we need to do at this moment. Uh, This series called True North uh, is what the Lord has put in my heart really to share with you all for the next few weeks together. And so I'm going to lay just the groundwork for where we're going the next few weeks so you all understand what's happening today, what's going to happen in the next couple weeks. And I highly encourage you, don't skip any of these weeks. Okay, you should not skip church ever, right? Like, come to church every Sunday. But I know reality hits, and sometimes uh, you got to do what you got to do, right? But if you can be here for these next four weeks, I highly encourage you because this is really important. Everything we do is important, but I, I honestly feel like this is a really, really important time. So please come, please engage. So I want to lay the groundwork for what we're going to do. Today, we are talking very particularly about fixing our eyes on Jesus. That it is so vital, so important as we think about this election, but also what's to come after this election, that we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. The, the moment we take our eyes off of him is the moment we lose our way in this world. So, so we, we have to. So, so what's going to happen today, we're going to talk about that. That's what we're going to be doing today. Next week, we're going to be talking about abortion and pro-life, or you could say even pro-abundant life. And uh, that's really important for us, to be grounded in Scripture. After that, we're going to be talking about marriage. uh, And uh, the fact that we are pro-marriage here. Not according to the way the world necessarily defines it, but the way the Bible defines what marriage is. Uh, And we need to lay that framework and that groundwork for us. And kind of give us that navigation point. The final week will be on us talking about salt and light. How do we be salt and light in this world? No matter what happens at the election, no matter what comes down or doesn't come down, we need to understand as followers of Jesus, how are we supposed to be salt and light? And so that, that's, that's the groundwork, okay? Everybody with me? We're good? Awesome. This is going to be fantastic, okay? So this is going to be good. So we are going to begin in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're jumping into here. And we're going to jump right into a prayer. We're actually starting in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 1. And it is in the middle of the Apostle Paul's kind of uh, train of thought. So um, it might feel a little awkward to jump into this point. I'm going to start here and then we'll get a little bit of the context. Ephesians 1 starting verse 19. This is what Paul writes. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, as I said, we're jumping into Paul's prayer and that really begins up in verse 15 down to verse 23. As we're focusing here this morning, this is the point I want to make for us. We're going to hit at this for just a few minutes. The main point is this, that God 
wants to invade our lives with his mighty power. So Paul's praying here, and he's praying for the church in Ephesus. And if you look back up at verse 18, there are three things that Paul is praying for. The first one in verse 18 is he's praying that they would know the hope to which they are called. So he's praying that they would know that they have hope in this world. The second thing he's praying for in verse 18 is he's praying that they would know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. These two prayers are amazing. Praying for their hope. Praying that they, as followers of Jesus, would know that they themselves are Jesus' glorious inheritance. Isn't that amazing? You are his inheritance. Awesome stuff, isn't that? And, And so the third thing he's praying for is he's praying for power. You see it at verse 19 where I jumped in. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Now, whenever we read the word know in Scripture... We know it's not just to know something as far as just information. Yes, there is, uh, Christianity is, is a, you know, about knowledge. We need to know God. We need to know who he is. But it's not just about knowing him. It's also about experiencing him. And so what Paul is praying for here is he's that they would know hope. They would know the riches. That they would know power. Not just in their head. But to experience these things in their life. And so this is so great for us to realize that what Paul is praying for in verse 19 is that God would invade our lives with his mighty power. Not just that we would know that God is powerful. Because we can know God is powerful and yet not experience his power in our lives. And so what Paul does here is he, he kind of stacks on these words. You see it in verse 19. Immeasurable greatness, mighty, great power of God. He is just, it feels as if Paul is like grabbing for words, right, to describe how amazingly powerful God is. And he's just trying to get it in our minds. This is who our God is. But if you look at verse 19, what he also does is he is praying that the mighty, the vast, the immeasurable greatness of God's power would be directed toward us who believe. You see it in verse 19. So not just that you would know that God is powerful, but that power would invade your life. The word toward there in verse 19 has that idea that there's an invasion in something. There's a penetration. Uh, there's an overflow. There's a release of God's power in our lives. And so if you and I want to live a powerful, a victorious life... We must ask God for power. His power. Remember, Paul is praying. He's asking for God to do something in their life. And if you and I want to live a powerful, victorious life with God, we have to ask him to release his power toward us. Friends, you and I are a community of believing in the power of God, the mighty power of God. And so what Paul does uh, in the verses that are following here in verse 19 is he, he kind of pulls out all the stops in a very contained, kind of power-packed few verses to demonstrate the power of God. And it's all focused on Jesus Christ, the victor. Jesus Christ, Has won. And we see the way he describes it here. Look at verse 19. The resurrection power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that God wants to release in your life. So so we can say that, but not truly experience it. But let's think about it, okay? The power that rose Jesus who died on the cross was put into the grave for three days and rose him from the dead and he came out of that grave alive to never die again is the same power that is at work in your life and in my life. You see it there. This is amazing. He says, the power for us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he rose him from the dead. Wow! I'm fired up! 
I need that power. And I think you do too. The power that rose Christ, the resurrection power that rose him, is the power that worked in you. So yes, we believe that Jesus lived the perfect life. Yes, we believe that Jesus died. But friends, if Christ did not raise from the dead, you and I are wasting our time. And we should just close up shop and go do something else on Sunday morning and for the rest of our lives. But Christ is risen. It is the pinnacle of God's saving work, the resurrection of Jesus. There are other people in the New Testament that experience resurrection. We think of Lazarus, right? Lazarus died. Jesus rose him from the dead. But you know what? Lazarus died again. We have other stories of a little girl who died and Jesus rose her from the dead, but she died again. Jesus' resurrection is significantly different because in his resurrection, he defeated death, he defeated the devil, and he defeated sin because he never died again. Risen in life, exalted to never die again. Again, so here's the point. When Jesus Christ won, because he won, you and I have power over sin in our life. And if he is not risen from the dead, we have no power over sin. Sin has complete power over us. The same power that rose Christ from the dead is the power at work in you, giving you new life spiritually and giving you power over sin in your life. Now, to be clear, This doesn't mean you will live a sinless life. Uh, Believe me, if you lived in my family, you talk to my wife and to my kids, uh, they would attest to the fact that Garrett Nate still sins. (laughs) Talk to my staff. (laughs) Talk to to anyone who knows me. But the besetting sins in my life and in your life no longer have power. power to live not sin less but to sin less make sense if we're going to have victory over sin it comes from a release of his power in us this is the point that paul is making this is the point why he's praying for them christ the victor leads us to victory over sin it's amazing the same power then that rose christ from the dead You see it in the verse here, the same power that was Christ from the dead is the same exact power that seats Christ in ultimate, final, and unending authority. Look at the verse. He says there, according to the power that rose Christ from the dead in verse 20, and then Paul just continues on in his train of thought thinking, and he just says there, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the same power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that seats Christ in ultimate, final, and unending authority. We submit ourselves willingly to the authority of Jesus Christ. We are pro-authority, you could say. (laughs) We live under his authority. And the way that Paul describes this is, is giving us this idea that it is unending that it goes on and on and on. It is ultimate. So you see the verse, what he says. Christ is seated. Which is referring to his lordship. It's his lordship. He's not sitting on a chair. He's not sitting on a stool. He's sitting on a throne. Right now. Currently reigning forever and ever and ever. He is the king Of the universe, reigning in authority right now. So the resurrection proclaims to us that he lives forever, to never die again. And this exalted position proclaims to us that he will reign forever and ever and ever. The verse tells us that he is sitting in lordship. It tells us he's sitting at the right hand of God which is the position of honor and power. 
So when you think about these, these words, you know, it's not as if God physically has a right hand. It's metaphorical for a position of power, a position of honor. And then the third thing that Paul references here, at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. It is this prominent place of ultimate authority. He is enthroned above all powers, earthly and heavenly, spiritual and material, seen and unseen. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, far above, Paul would say, all rule. You see it in the verse. All rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, every name, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Unending authority that Jesus holds. The scope that Paul describes for us is unending. Anything that is created, anything that we can see, anything that is unseen, any sort of demonic activity, satanic activity, comes under the ultimate authority of Jesus Christ. So here's the point. Because Jesus Christ won, satanic power and demonic forces will not prevail. That's power, right? You and I are living in an evil world system. That is merely the surface level. The evil world system that we live in is rooted in satanic powers and demonic activity. What we see with our eyes is simply the surface level. And it's all underneath of it is this satanic activity and demonic activity. We have to have this world view that leads us to believe these things. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, reminds us of this world view. Reminds us here in Ephesians 1. But if you have your Bible, I want to highlight for us a couple other places. In chapter 2, verse 2, if you have your Bible, you can just move your eyes down or in your device. You see in verse 2 of chapter 2, he says this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul highlights for us that there is a spiritual power at work on the canvas of our lives in this world. Uh, and then over in chapter 6, if you have your Bible, you can turn over one page to the right. Paul says this in chapter 6, verse 10 and following. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put in the whole armor of God, what? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see what Paul does through all of Ephesus, this just book here. He's giving us a worldview that allows us to understand that there is a spiritual dark world. And all of that activity is being played out in what we see and what we experience in this world. That is why I'm saying the evil world system that we live in is rooted in satanic activity and demonic forces. So when we come to an election season, and I'm just going to be totally blunt with you, as we come to an election season that's dealing with abortion, that's dealing with marriage, it's trying to totally chip away at the very fabric of society this is demonic activity friends this is evil this is not right this is wrong and so we have to see below the surface about what paul is telling us there is a present darkness that is active but we have this promise in chapter 1, this prayer that Paul prays for this church in Ephesus. And what is he praying? That Jesus Christ, who is victorious, reigns and rules over all of that. Because Jesus Christ won, satanic forces and demonic activity will not prevail. 
because they cannot dethrone the authority of Jesus Christ. So as we see these evil things happening, our hope is in him. Right? We have to keep our eyes fixed on him, his authority, his position. What we know is that evil is on a leash. Because Jesus Christ won in this world and in your life, you have power to push back against satanic activity and demonic forces. Now keep in mind what Paul says in chapter 6. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the present darkness. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind. Yes, as we push back, we say no to certain things. We, we say no because why? There's a release of power in your life. The power that rose Christ, the power that seats him, is the power that Paul is praying would be in your life and in my life. His mighty power provokes our courage, doesn't it? And says we have courage to act on our convictions and to push back in the appropriate ways, in the right ways, in the ways that honor Christ, in the ways that exalt him. Third point I want to make is this. Because Jesus Christ won, then we are emboldened to act in our convictions without fear. Look at verses 22 and 23. 22 it's, it's describing to us that not only is Christ an authority over all of creation, but he's also an authority in his church. So when you and I are orientated to Jesus Christ, the victor, we are orientated to his authority. And he rules us by his word. And so as we orientate ourselves to Jesus, it's an orientation to his word. What does his word say? Not, not what do my words say, not what your words say, whether I like it or dislike it. What is Jesus' word guiding us to? And therefore, what the verse says then is that because he fills us with power and presence, we are emboldened to act in our convictions without fear. Does that mean we're going to get what we want? Does it mean that we will have some sort of influence beyond what we can have. No. It means in our life, we act on our convictions without courage, or without fear, excuse me. And so let me encourage you with a couple things. One, would you pray, please, for me? Would you pray for this church? Would you pray for yourselves? Uh, it is not easy. I don't take it lightly to stand in front of you week after week and open up the scriptures to you. I feel many weeks that I'm standing on holy ground before you as we open up the scriptures together. And as we move into topics that are very challenging and difficult to deal with, I need courage. And so do you. And so would you please pray for me? Would you please pray for us? Pray for your own life that you and I would be emboldened to act on our convictions without fear. Last thing I want to say to us is this. You and I need to ask God for his power. It's, it's wonderful to read God's word, and we need to. We submit to it. But we also need to take our cues from it. What is Paul doing here? He's praying for God to invade that church with his mighty power. Power to overcome sin, power to overcome satanic activity, power to, for, for courage. And so what we need to do, we need to ask God for his power. You and I have hope in these tumultuous times. God is still speaking. God is still moving. He is still on the throne. And so our hope is in him. So let us ask for his power to be released in our lives. I'm going to pray for that very specifically, and then we're going to take communion together. Jamie's going to come and lead us in communion this morning. 
And so please stand with me. We'll sing a song together, and then we'll take communion. Father, we come before you humbled, We bring before you our fears, our anxieties, the things that are really challenging for us to understand from a human level. And we need you to release your power in our lives, collectively, together. We confess that we have often tried to make it through this world and tried to make sense of this world on our own understanding and our own power, only to find that we have gotten nowhere. And so we come asking for you to do a mighty work in us. The power that rose Christ from the dead would give us power over sin. We ask for your power to release so that satanic activity and demonic forces would be put away. And we ask that you give us courage to act in our convictions. We thank you that, Jesus, you have released us from the tyranny of Satan and all evils. Help us to live from that position of victory. Release your power in us for the good of your name and the advance of your kingdom. We are your children, sons and daughters, and we love you. In Jesus' name.